So now that we've reviewed key contextual information relating to In a London Drawing Room by George Eliot, let's now do a line by line analysis of this poem. So now let's do a line by line analysis of In a London Drawing Room by George Eliot. And of course, remember that this poem appears as part of AQA's Worlds and Lives anthology, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm gonna begin by reading the entire stanza of this poem. It's written in just one stanza. And then once I do that, I'll do, literally do a line by line analysis, starting with the title and of course, each sentence within this stanza. So I'm gonna begin by reading through it. In a London drawing room, the sky is cloudy, yellowed by the smoke. For view, there are the houses opposite, cutting the sky with one long line of wall, like solid fog. Far as the eye can stretch, monotony of surface and of form, without a break to hang a guess upon. No bird can make a shadow as it flies, for all is shadow, as in ways overhung by the thickest canvas, where the golden rays are clothed in hemp. No figure lingering pauses to feed the hunger of the eye or rest a little on the lap of life. All hurry on and look upon the ground or glance unmarking at the passers-by. The wheels are hurrying to cabs, carriages, all closed in multiple identity. The world seems one huge prison house and court where men are punished at the slightest cost with lowest rate of colour, warmth and joy. So let's now go over the title to begin with, In a London Drawing Room. So this poem describes the speaker's view from their drawing room, okay? So contextually, remember that George Eliot wrote this in 1865, describing Victorian London. And of course, I've mentioned this in the context notes, but if somebody, so first you remember that a drawing room was usually a really, really nice living room in a very large mansion. So of course, even from the title, we kind of are told and in the, the social status of the speaker is indicated, right? They're definitely upper class. And of course, they're viewing things from that perspective. Now, the word in, in a London drawing room, right? This preposition is somewhat misleading because... Uh, we think we'll learn what's inside the drawing room, right? When we actually just look at first, just at the title, we're thinking, okay, cool, this poem is going to probably be ab about, you know, what's going on inside this really nice and fancy drawing room, right? So this preposition is quite misleading. However, we then, of course, learn as we read through this poem that actually this sitting in the standpoint, or rather where they're sitting inside the drawing room, they're actually describing the city that they see outside, okay? So this is really interesting. Now, of course, when you're also thinking about this, I've mentioned this already, but this title, especially the reference to drawing room, illustrates just how privileged and sheltered the speaker is from the city's harshness, okay? The, the watching the city, you know, and the harshness and the stark reality of the city, but from a very comfortable and sheltered view, okay? So they're, they're nicely distant from it. Now, when you're thinking about the structure of the poem, as I said, it's one single stanza of 19 lines written in iambic pentameter. And what this is uh, illustrate, illustrating when you're thinking about George Eliot, perhaps what she did and why she deliberately did this is to suggest the monotony of city life, okay? This, uh, this meter, iambic pentameter, is being used maybe to show the repetitive monotony of city life. Now, in the first line, the speaker refers to how the sky is cloudy, yellowed by the smoke. Now here, pathetic fallacy is used quite effectively because it's illustrating how the sky in London is tainted by all the smoke and pollution of the city, of industry, and of course, of the Industrial Revolution. In the second line, where the speaker refers to, for view, there are the houses opposite. Here they use on John Mont, and what they're illustrating is the view from what, what they can see is quite drab and uninspiring. Now, in the third line, this reference to one long line of wall. Here, they're using hyperbole. The speaker is using hyperbole. And what they're is saying and what they're showing, the image that they're painting in our minds, is that the houses all around the city that they're viewing create a barrier. There's a barrier between man and nature, okay? And nature is being blocked out and sidelined. Also, the speaker uses this simile to illustrate how the city's houses are blocking and cutting off the sky. There's this clear division between man-made objects and nature. However, there's this emphasis and this reference, perhaps, to how unnatural and how monotonous and uninspiring this has made city life become. 
also this reference to the words cloudy and smoke in lines one and fog in lines four illustrates how drab, dull and dark this city is. Okay, this is really, really powerful imagery. Now in the next line, this reference to the monotony of surface and of form. Here the speaker is using on John Mont to slow down the pace of the poem, right? It's dragging on, much like life is dragging on for Londoners. And the reference to surface and form in this line illustrates how this line of houses is identical in surface and it's uniform, okay? And John Mont usually actually creates anticipation, but here, right, Elliot is actually using it somewhat ironically because she's piling on one disenchanting image on top of another. Now in the next line, this reference to without break to hang a guess upon. Here, what the speaker is basically saying is that all the houses that they can see in London look really predictable. There's no mystery to explore. There's no shape to question. They're all kind of really, really um, kind of almost copycat. And there's nothing interesting that stands out. Also, the reference to how there's no bird that can make a shadow. Here we can see that the birds are overshadowed by the darkness and density of urban life. And the reference and the repetition of shadow illustrates that the sun, another aspect of nature, can't cut through all the smoke and all the fog and all the pollution. So of course, what we're getting is a really, really dark image of this city. Now, the reference to overhung by the thickest canvas. Here, what the speaker is basically saying is that the shadow that's being cast is like a huge canvas that's hanging over the city. And the reference to golden rays is, it's there's this contrast between, you know, this man-made pollution and nature, the sun being vibrant and colorful, but that's being blocked out by, you know, this overpowering man-made objects and artifacts, and of course, also the pollution. Now, the reference to uh, these golden rays being clothed in hemp, here the speaker uses caesura to illustrate how the sun's rays are covered by hemp, which is a common dull material. Also, this present continuous verb shows that nobody in London is standing still, they're rushing ahead, right? And this is very typical of London city life, even today, right? And the speaker is showing here that, you know, everyone's just really tense, they're running around. So the city, not only is it drab, monotonous, uninspiring, but people don't even have time to stop and smell the flowers, as it were. Also, this metaphor illustrates that no one can even pause and satisfy the curiosity by looking around. The only person who can actually look around and who has the luxury of looking around is this speaker who's seated in a drawing room. They don't have to go and work to make the daily bread. They're the only people who can kind of look around. But of course, as they look around on this city, they're realizing just how uninspiring it is and how people actually to some extent also seem trapped. Also, the reference to rest a little and lap of life here, the speaker's using metaphor and alliteration, showing that in the busy metropolis, right, this busy city, no one can pause, enjoy the area. It's only the speaker who can pause and gaze from the comfort of their drawing room. Also, the reference to eye, look and glance. Here, the language belonging to the semantic field of vision actually ironically illustrates the lack of vision people have, right? People can't stop and enjoy what's around them, the sights and sounds around them. They literally are just working and going to and from work, only having maybe enough time to rest before they wake up for another day of drudgery. Also, the reference to all, this pronoun, what the speaker is trying to do here, and of course also the poet by extension, is they're emphasizing how everybody's lost their individuality. The crowd only stands out to the speaker as observing it because it's so uniform. Also, the reference to hurry and look on the ground. Once more, this reference to what they can see, vision. The speaker does this to just re-emphasize that everyone's gaze is cast down. The spirits are broken in the city, which is in the throes of the Industrial Revolution. Then the harsh consonants in the words cabs and carriage shows us the harsh reality that everyone in London is in. The, the, they're in a rush. They're actively avoiding eye contact with other city dwellers. They don't even have time to form relationships with each other, right? Because they're too busy just running around, working and barely even making a living. Also, the fact that all is closed, right? Here we've got caesura and there's this sense of entrapment that's been created through caesura. Then the speaker states... The world seems one huge prison house and court. Now, this use of hyperbole metaphor within this phrase is really powerful because we can see here that the city dwellers feel trapped by industrialization and urbanization, right? I mean, the whole point of industrialization and urbanization was to make our lives easier. However, 
ironically, right, living as urbanites, they actually feel uh, they've become even more trapped. Then the speaker refers to where the men are punished. And here what the speaker is basically trying to illustrate is that the working classes are one big faceless machine that's trapped and punished by this endless cycle of work and obligation. And in the final line, this reference to colour, warmth and joy. Here the speaker uses Rule of Three to portray a really depressing image of life in London and by extension, to be honest, industrial cities which are popping up as a result of the Industrial Revolution, right? So of course, not only is this poem emblematic of London at the time, right, in the Victorian era, when it was at the height of the Industrial Revolution, it also is symbolic of other cities like Manchester, Leeds, Sheffield, Newcastle, all of these places that were touched by the Industrial Revolution and these factories sprung up. However, the speaker is basically showing that this happened at a really massive cost. There's this distance between man and nature. And of course, everybody seems really, really sad, downcast and trapped by life in the city. So that's really it when it comes to this poem. I hope you've enjoyed it. And of course, if you like this video, do consider subscribing to this channel. Thank you so much for listening.